Hey, e-commerce marketing podcast listener. I wanted to let you know that we have created a six month guide to marketing your e-commerce store. You can download this guide by visiting getosi.com forward slash guide or by texting get OSI to 33444. This guide will show you how to get more traffic, sales, and conversions for your online store. Get the guide right now by visiting getosi.com forward slash guide or by texting get OSI to 33444. Welcome back to the e-commerce marketing podcast, everyone. I am your host, Arlen Robinson. And today we have a very special guest with us, Ryan Culp, who is the founder of FOMO, which is a social proof marketing platform that helps drive and convert traffic on e-commerce storefronts. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Arlen. Yeah, not, not a problem. You know, before we get started, we're going to be talking today about conversion rate optimization, and you're going to provide us some insight into that. But before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started, and a little bit about FOMO? Sure. Well, you know, my personal background was definitely a long and winding winding path to FOMO. I grew up and played music. You know, I, I wrote songs, I recorded, I toured a little bit, performed around 300 times uh, by the age of 20. And I thought I was going to be a rock star. Okay. And when that didn't happen, <laughs> I kind of got into experiential marketing, um, you know, doing PR stunts for brands like Coca-Cola and Samsung, E-Network, and then customer service, and then cold email and SEO, and then kind of moved to Thailand for a bit and got into uh, to programming. Finally, I joined a venture capital fund. And while I was at that venture capital fund about two and a half years ago, uh, I founded FOMO in March 2016. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, so it sounds like you had a pretty diverse background, as you said. You wanted to be a rock star. So, what instrument did you play? I played uh, primarily guitar. You okay. know, I started with with violin, and I still play violin. And okay. Probably better at violin than I am at marketing, um, <laughs> but it's just not very useful. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. And, uh, yeah, then got into guitar, and even now I take piano lessons, so I'm still kind of developing that skill. But okay, you know, primarily focused on technology and. In between all of that, you know, did everything from making gold teeth to giving presentations for Teach for America, kind of everything in between. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. That's awesome. Now, for the audience members that aren't familiar with the acronym FOMO, <laughs> and I don't know if it was it you that coined that term, or I'm not sure where the origin of that was. I mean, uh, why don't you Why don't you enlighten our audience a little bit about FOMO? Sure. So FOMO is an, an acronym often um, kind of spelled out uh, all capital letters, F-O-M-O, and it stands for fear of missing out. And, you know, more and more today, we're actually seeing folks use this term to talk about things like crypto, you know, but in, in theory or in principle, FOMO is the phenomenon that we experience, even just socially, you know, and our friends are, are going out and having fun and maybe we're staying home to study or we're staying home to, you know, do some chores around the house. We, we can say that we have FOMO. And um, so we're really, you know, proud of our name. We're proud to kind of associate the, the ethos of our platform with, um, with the term that a lot of folks understand. But I will say, though, that we've traveled around the world a bit as a team for different events and, um, and retreats. And FOMO evidently is mostly an American acronym. And so okay. when we went to Australia a few weeks ago, for example, nobody knew what it was. And they okay. said, FOMO, what's that mean? You know, so that's been kind of fun, too. OK, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't know that it was just isolated to a, a U.S. term. But, yeah, it's really cool how you guys have associated your, your, your brand with it, because I think it's a, a really interesting acronym. Now, as far as speaking of, you know, the fear of missing out and and how that ties into everything. Um, of course, today we're going to be talking about conversion rate optimization. I know you've got a lot of experience in that. The majority of our listeners are, of course, e-commerce businesses and people that do marketing for e-commerce businesses. So how, how do you think an average e-commerce business really should first approach conversion rate optimization? And I guess you may want to kind of do a quick definition of that. Sure. So quick definition of, of conversion rate optimization, or usually people will say, right, CRO, is saying, all right, here's my traffic, here's my product, here's my pricing, here's my level of service, here's kind of everything I have to offer, and let's calculate from that, let's extract from that how often I'm able to acquire a customer. So, you know, I get a thousand hits a week on my store, I have sell red shoes for 50 bucks, 
If I make 200 bucks a week, I get four conversions over a thousand. Obviously, that's not very good. And that becomes my conversion rate. And so conversion rate optimization is therefore saying, how can I keep all things the same? Same pricing, same product, same service, same website, same traffic, same traffic sources, but actually create you know, more revenue, create more sales. Right. And so that's saying, how can I get the most out of what I already have? Right. And so, you know, sometimes people think about conversion rate optimization and they say, well, let's make uh, better ads and that kind of thing. And there's something to be said there, but what we get really excited about and where we, you know, specialize in is helping you create more sales without any additional elements, without changing your pricing and without, you know, overhauling your website. Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I appreciate that definition. And, you know, I think to, to answer your question, right, how, how should the average store approach CRO? Your first, it's don't. When you're just starting, and, and I know you probably have listeners that are, that are crushing it, you've got listeners who maybe they're just starting, and of course, everywhere in between. But when you're just starting, even to somewhere in between, you know, CRO is not, is not really the best way to spend your time, right? Let's say, in theory, you could even double your conversion rate from 2%, which is the average e-commerce store conversion rate, a little less than 2%, to 4%. But if you only make a hundred bucks a month, right, it doesn't really matter. Right. Potentially you should, you know, increase your traffic or add more products or increase your average cart value from twenty bucks to twenty five bucks. Mm-hmm. And everything else can stay the same. So the first approach to CRO is to not approach it until you know that an increase in CRO would actually make a difference, you know, to your bottom line. So First, is get sales. Get some sale, right? The average store converts 2%. Mm-hmm. If you convert even half of a percent, that's fine. It won't be as good as the average store, you know, optimized from price to UX and product market fit, et cetera. Right. But if you can get 200 unique visitors and that turns into one sale, that's a half percent conversion rate, you know, now quadruple it, right? So that's kind of your starting point. But you have to have the benchmark before you can take the next step to improve upon it. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So it's really... For a, a new startup business that's just getting out there, doesn't really have many sales. It doesn't make sense. You, you've got to kind of get out there and, like you said, establish the the benchmark. Now, for those businesses that you know they're getting some sales, they've been out there maybe for a little bit, and of course they want to improve their their conversion rate. What what are some simple and inexpensive changes that they can make to their website or to their whole process overall to inc- improve their conversion rate? Sure. So really great question. And I think there's a lot of answers to this question found in sort of the lean startup methodology. Not mm-hmm. that I'm a huge fan of that, but mm-hmm. there, are, there are elements of how we often thrash and think about building software mm-hmm. that are definitely applicable to, to e-commerce. And so one of those maxims is that the less scalable a tactic is, the better it converts. Okay. Right. And so really, a really good example would be live chat. You know, if you drop a live chat widget on your store, and again, you're not here doing this and thinking about this until you have some benchmark, right? Okay, 1% conversion. Okay, I've got my price. I've got my website. I've got my moment. But when you get there, say, all right, I want to increase. What are some simple things I can do? Live chat is a great first win, right? You add a widget to your site, but and that's okay. And if you're actually present and you can respond within a moment or two, that's great. But where you can get really crazy, where now we're even less scalable than a live chat widget with, with canned answers or, or bot replies, is what if you put in your cell phone number and you let people text you? You know, a few months ago, I built an app for Shopify called Mobile Chat. Okay. And that's all it did. It added a little banner, only visible to mobile visitors. And uh, as they scrolled up and down your storefront, it said, you know, have questions, text us. And if they tapped it, it would actually figure out whether they were on an iPhone or an Android. Oh, wow. And it would open up their native SMS app, and it would pre-fill a text message to whatever cell number you connected okay. to the Shopify app, and it would even pre-fill content. So I have a question about dot, dot, dot. And all they would have to do is type in, you know, your red shoes and hit send. Okay. And now you're having a one-on-one conversation with this visitor. And as we know, we get 100 visitors, and we have a 2% conversion rate. That means mm. 98 98 of those people bounce. But when you add something like a cell phone number and you create that one-to-one link between you and the customer, suddenly maybe only 97 or 96 or 95. And if you can turn even two conversations per 100 mm-hmm. into a, more of a relationship, at the very least, you have their information to send them offers later. They can't close the sale now. And if you connect something like Google Voice to these, you know, for this tactic, now you can actually do this a little bit at scale. So again, we want to do things that are scalable, but we kind of want to scale the unscalable. Mm-hmm. So if you can attach a Google Voice, now you're enabled to respond to these text messages from your computer, right. which means you can type faster. It means you can have copy and paste replies for common questions. And suddenly, your conversion rate 
from one or two per hundred visitors. Now you're actually having dozens of chats and you're converting a lot of those to sales. Yeah. So that would be a, a really simple, really inexpensive and really immediate change you can make, particularly if you're looking at your traffic, you know, you're in your analytics and you see just thousands of visitors coming to your site and thousands of visitors leaving, mm-hmm. right? Drop a phone number, right? Drop a live chat, sit on it, even mm-hmm. just for a couple hours a day. If you don't want to have a bad experience for people at 2 a.m. trying to chat you and, and you're sleeping, right. just turn the widget on and off, right? Turn it on, sit on, on it for an hour a day. If you talk to somebody, turn it off so it doesn't show up. And that's, again, a really quick and, quick and dirty way to, to figure out if maybe your website is lacking educational material, right? Or if maybe the pricing's not great, so people live chat you and they ask for discounts. Mm-hmm. You won't really know until you, you open up that feedback portal why they're why they're not converting. Right, right. Yeah, I love that advice. You know, all of that really does kind of go under the category of, I guess you could say, increasing the engagement that you have with the customer. And and that that really can make a huge difference because taking that next step, like you said, putting on the live chat or doing the the messaging, the Facebook messaging, adding a Google voice, you're just giving an, you're opening up a whole nother channel for you to establish a deeper relationship with the customer. And then all of those things just allow customers to help get to trust you, trust your brand, trust everything that you're providing, you know, and especially these days, because, you know, there's, there's so many sites, there's so many options when people are are looking to purchase a a product or service. And I think people's overall level of, I guess you could say suspicion when, when dealing with brands, especially new brands, is, is I think a, a, a little bit more heightened these days. I'm sure you can agree. And so those types of things like a live chat can, can help you know, alleviate that suspicion. And so, yeah, that's, that's a, a great piece of advice. Now, when we're talking about conversion rate optimization, of course, in the beginning we talked about you know, changes made to the website. You, of course, mentioned the, the simple change of adding the live chat. Now, of course, well, a business doesn't want to have to do an entire modification to the the website. You know, you never want to do that unless you absolutely have to. But I think it's something we should address. Mm -hmm. At one point, do you think a business when analyzing, you know, their the rate of conversion, you know, what point do you think they really need to consider in an entire website redesign to improve things? Sure. Really great question. So from personal experience with websites I've managed and been a part of, and also personal observation, mm-hmm. I think most website redesigns are, are sort of just at the, I don't want to say the folly, but they're at this sort of preference of, of the makers behind it, right? So, you know, right. you're on your website more than anyone else, whether mm-hmm. you have a store, a piece of software, even if you're a dentist, you're spending so much time on your site and it, it's natural that you're going to kind of find flaws in it and you're going to have hunches, you know, well, if only this was like this and if only that page looked that way, you know, we'd convert more. And so the website redesign as a tactic, even though it's a very big one, is I kind of think common, but it's not usually data driven. It's mm-hmm. usually just, you know what, I want a new site and I want a new site, right? Mm-hmm. I've, I've been looking at this forever and I'm sick of it. And I've certainly redone sites where that was my base motivation and that's not great. But in the context of DRO, I think at least first get a 50, 100 sales, mm-hmm. right? And that might be a thousand hits. That might take a hundred thousand hits before you get there. But until you've got a little bit of a replicable process where every week you can kind of predict or really better every month, you can predict how much traffic and how many sales you're going to get and how many reviews you're going to get and the, the quality of those reviews and how few returns you're going to have, you know, the basic operational components of running a store. Mm-hmm. I think figure that out first. And again, my off the top is just, you know, get a hundred sales first and essentially set it up so that your redesign is the last thing you consider. Because, you know, I recently helped someone just about four months ago, okay. they acquired a Shopify store and immediately they said, you know, let's redesign it. It looks bad. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we did it. You know, I kind of agreed with them, you know, we, we were buying it to improve it. Right. We were right. buying it to keep the status quo. So we immediately, we bought a theme. We made, you know, obviously tweaks to that theme, doing a lot of little HTML and then testing it on different devices. You know, redesigns are not fun. You know, they're not usually pleasant. <laughs> yeah, have they're not. breaks, links stop working. You know, and, and what we found was that, yeah, the site looks better now, but the conversion rate isn't any better. Mm-hmm. And in particular, depending on your store and the type of people you attract, if you have a store that relishes in a lot of repeat purchases, let's say 20, 30% of your business is repeat, which is, in my experience, a huge amount for an e-commerce store, maybe a new redesign is dangerous because mm-hmm. now your existing customers who have kind of gotten used to being able to navigate your site um, half asleep, now they have to learn something new. So you're almost kind of punishing 
their top customers to offer something new. But Mm -hmm. on the flip side, if 99% of your business is from new folks and you've examined that your exit rate is very high from the homepage or people aren't really clicking around your navs, your sub navs, and they're just not discovering a lot of your SKUs, Mm -hmm. then I think redesigns make sense. And particularly if you have a lot of SKUs, you know, you can see in analytics that, wow, you know, 90% of my traffic is going to 10 SKUs my goal is to increase exposure to the other 900 SKUs. Well, then a redesign makes sense too. But even then, I think you can start small. I think you could just drop in, you know, a better fuzzy search tool, right? And, mm. and, and track the search queries or add more tags or add more drop downs. Not too many, but you could, you could start there if that's your goal. But if the idea is just, I hate how my site looks, let's redesign it. Right. I don't think that we can qualify that as some surefire conversion rate optimization tactic. Right, right. I, I definitely understand that. And I, I've been there as well as a as a, as a business owner. We're, you know, sometimes we just like, oh, you know, we've had this site for a few years, I'm tired of it. And, you know, <laughs> we're just going to redo it. But, you know, like you said, there's no there's no set metrics to say that we really need to do that or that doing that will actually increase our conversions. But, you know, so I I think it's it's a, it's a road that a lot of uh, owners go through, but yeah, you you really need to make sure it makes sense because there's a lot to it. You know, not only do you got, you have the redesign, you know, there's, there's issues that come up after it's redesigned. You know, there's little, there's always little bugs that come up, little links that may not work. And it's, it's always more to it than you think. So yeah, it truly makes sense that that's, that should really be the last resort or only if the data speaks to a redesign as far as, like you said, not maybe being able to reach certain SKUs as easily as possible, have poor navigation, stuff like that, then, you know, maybe it makes sense mm-hmm. to to do it. Now, as a, as a rule of thumb, one of the things that I always encourage business owners to do, and, and just people in, in general, with, with regards to e-commerce, since everything is just out there, everything is all available on, on, the, on the internet, I always look to get not really advice, but get some direction from what some of the other top companies are doing, top e-commerce companies are doing. So what, what do you what would you say are some top e-commerce sites that a business can learn from with regards to conversion rate optimization or, or, or doing things that are pretty optimal with regards to converting customers? Sure. So a, a few examples, and I'll, I'll probably just mention some some FOMO clients so that you see our product in action as well. But sure. even without FOMO installed in these sites, I think they're excellent examples and, and case studies for e-commerce done right as, as standalone brands. So one of them would be Kettle and Fire. They okay. sell bone broth and soups, so chicken bone broth, beef bone broth. This is kind of like the stuff you'd have in pho if you ate at a Vietnamese restaurant. Okay, It's really healthy for you. Mm-hmm. Some people use it as a meal replacement. And, and it, is, it is really tasty. I've, I've obviously had it. Okay, right. <laughs> and a couple of things that, that they do really well. One, they have just an insane volume of reviews. Okay. Right. So when you're when you're communicating with customers during the fulfillment process after they get the product delivered, you know, of course you want to review, but a lot of us don't do a great job asking for it. Right. We don't ask for it at the right time. Right. We might ask for a review before it's even been delivered, mm-hmm. or we know it's been delivered. We're, we're smart enough to track that, but we haven't asked. We ask for it before it's been consumed. <laughs> so if, if my uh, bone broth is delivered on Sunday probably don't ask me on Sunday, you know, it's just going to be sitting in the box at my front door. I'm not going to consume it for a few days. And so they really nailed the exact moment at which a customer is likely to have consumed their product and is willing to talk about it. Okay. And so when you go to their site, you'll see literally thousands of reviews. You know, you can spend 30 minutes reading lots of different perspectives, three star, four star, five star, you know, here's why I liked it. Here's why I didn't. And ultimately that helps the, the consumer make the best decision for them because they don't they don't care what you say about you, they care what other people say about them. Right. So that's something they do really well. Another client FOMO, you know, install partner is Pure Vita Bracelets. Okay. They're a uh, they're using Shopify. Actually so is Kettle and Fire. Not that any of that really matters, but they have done some case studies on Shopify's blog as well. Mm-hmm. And that shares a lot more of their kind of details about how they go about it, what apps they use, how they've had the success they've had. But one thing they do that I really love is they just have a point of view. You, know, you go to their website, they sell bracelets and they sell different things, I think primarily to, to younger women. Mm-hmm. And so I'm a not middle-aged, but younger man. It's not exactly, you know, I'm not exactly their target audience. But when you go to the site, you get sucked in by their story. You get sucked in by 
and the social good they do and the way that they work with artisans and the way that they donate to Costa Rica, all these things kind of enter your brain space as mm. you're just browsing through their items. And right. a lot of stores don't achieve that. Right. A lot of stores are just giving you buy now buttons. And yeah. that's fine. And you want you know your visitors to take those objectives. But sometimes the the shortest path is like the long way around. You know? right. It's good to have a point of view to send someone to a piece of content and then they'll come back really supercharged mm-hmm. to buy it. I think one more client on that note that kind of combines the kettle on fire approach as well as the Pura Vita approach mm-hmm. are my friends who run Cup and Leaf. And this is a tea store, so different chais and black teas and oolong. And what I really like about them is they actually started as a blog. So all they did was review different teas. You know, here's what we think about this tea. You know, a couple, few paragraphs. And here's sort of like the, the flavor profile. Here's a photo of what it looks like. Mm-hmm. This is maybe it would be good for like the morning versus the afternoon, or it does or does not have a lot of caffeine. They started as a, as a blog, uh, tea reviews, and then they added the store component later. So now they've built up organic traffic. They've built up trust. They've built up recurring visitors who come back and say, great, I'm going to go to these guys who's the authority for recommending good teas. And what they did um, tactically is because they already started the blog on their main domain, they added their Shopify store to just shop.cupandleaf. Okay. And now, you know, again, going to cupandleaf.com is not a big sales pitch. It's just a resource to learn about teas. But if you are interested in shopping, you can head to just the storefront. And that's something that I'm seeing more and more successful um, brands do on e-commerce is put your brand and your story and your content on the main domain and put your shop kind of where it belongs. You know, just put it on shop dot or, or buy dot. You know, your whole business is just a storefront and you have slash blog. You may be kind of doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm not saying that that's really wrong. I, I think that there's, you know, there's trends that have started to take off that have demonstrated this is a good strategy. So a store that started five years ago you know, content wasn't as important then. Mm-hmm. Just not being on Amazon was important. Right. But nowadays, you know, we kind of are looking for a little bit more. And so, yeah, those are a few clients I think are doing really well. They're all using FOMO. Okay. Um, they're all using a lot of different apps for conversion optimization. Okay. And uh, I think all of them also have great case studies they've done on their own to kind oh. of articulate how oh. they have succeeded. Okay, great. Yeah, I appreciate those examples. Those are some great, solid examples. I wasn't familiar with those with those companies. But one of the things that I... That I think definitely rings true, especially if you're in a a space or whether you're offering a product or service and you're in a fairly crowded space where, you know, there's a lot of competition. I think, I mean, you, you've got to take it the next step and do whatever you can to set yourself apart, whether, like you said, with the bone and broth, they've got the tons of reviews. You know, they try to identify with the customers. They try to, you know set the story of how they created it all. Like you said, all those things do matter. You know, when you're developing a site, you know, you, of course, we've all seen the sites where, like you said, it's just some product information, buy now buttons, that's it, you know? And so, you know, those can work. Of course, you know, you, you do get those customers that know what they want. They've already decided what they want and they, they know they're going to buy from your site and, you know, they're just going to do it regardless. Cause you know, they're not concerned about you necessarily as a company or your brand. They just want the product. And so you're going to get those customers. Sure. But there still are a lot of people these days that need a little bit more than that to, you know, to really win them over. So, yeah, those those are all great examples. And I think they highly um, display the fact of taking that that next step. Now, before um, we wrap things up, I'd like you to see if you can share one final conversion rate optimization tip that, you know, business could do immediately and start seeing a, you know, a, a, a turnaround if, uh, if that is possible. Sure. So I'll actually approach this the other way around. Here's some things I think you should absolutely not do okay. to try to increase your conversion rate. And if you are doing them, the value you'll get from this is that you'll free up 10, 20, 30 minutes a day to do other things, okay. maybe live chat. <laughs> <laughs> do not change your button colors. Okay. Do not you know, hire photographers and redo every single photo unless they're terrible. You'll probably get more value from just compressing them or using an app that turns the background into a kind of white space. Mm -hmm. That that looks nice. Gets a 80-20 done for you without all the cost. Do not spend a bunch of time figuring out whether you should trigger your your emails at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. <laughs> People are living all over the place. 10 a.m. for you is 3 a.m. for them. Forget about it or they're traveling. It doesn't matter. And I just think if you if you take quick stock of the small tweaks you are making to your site, mm-hmm. uh, to your store, 
And and these are the small ones are usually the easy ones, right? So it's really addicting. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, today I did this activity. Yeah. You know, I made 15 tweaks, 15, 15 things I did. But if they're really kind of inconsequential, then actually what you could have done instead is spent those 45 minutes talking directly to five people on live chat mm-hmm. and close three out of five sales. Wow. You know, which one of those is more effective? And so yeah. it's tempting to say, well, I'm trying to do things that scale and will work forever, but the things that scale and work forever and are effective are not the quick and easy thing, like changing button colors. So as a, as a framework or way of thinking about it, hopefully this will free up some of your time to to do the bigger, uh, hairier goals. Right, right. That's that's true. Yeah, I think those that's some great advice because it, it does come down to maximizing your time because, I mean, that's the one thing that we all – you know, really can't buy anymore. There's only 24 hours in a day. And so it's, you've got to be careful of the time that you're spending. And so, you know, we, we've all been there where we've been kind of caught up doing little tweaks, little things that, you know, I guess you could say are busy, (laughs) busy work that aren't really adding Mm -hmm. to the bottom line. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to not get sucked into that rabbit hole, but, you know, taking stock of, of, of all of your time spent is, is very important and it can definitely free up other activities that can help improve your your conver- your conversion rate. Now, one thing I would like That's to right. kind of wrap things up with um, before we close things out is I want to kind of throw in there just kind of a quick fun question. What's one thing that our audience would truly be surprised to know about you? Well, I might have already spilled the beans here earlier. A couple, maybe a couple things. I I used to make gold teeth for a living. Um, okay. I went to college. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> and got into marketing. <laughs> okay. yeah, I worked with. Had to learn a little Korean in the process. Okay. Worked with a Korean guy, and he had a shop, a very successful one. Okay. Making gold teeth and kind of showed me the ropes there, working in a kind of quasi factory. Okay. Uh, yeah, really fond memories. Don't know if there's too much applicable knowledge from that experience, other than <laughs> persistence and learning minutia. Um, but those are those are important things to pick up as well. Okay, great. Well, that, that, that's awesome. Yeah, that's definitely one thing I would never, have, I wouldn't have guessed that you you had you've done in the past or had the ability to do making gold teeth. But yeah, I appreciate you sharing that fun fact. Well, Ryan, well, we definitely appreciate having you here on the e-commerce marketing podcast. Your t- tips and your information about conversion rate optimization, I know will be invaluable to everyone listening. And um, you know, thanks for taking the time. So if any business owners or anybody listening that would like to get in touch with you, how do they do it? Sure. You can email me. I'm ryan at usefomo.com. If you want to try out FOMO, I'm happy to extend a, a longer than usual trial to and put it on your site and see how it goes. You can also tweet at me. I like to tweet and blog about um, marketing and, and conversion rate optimization at ryancculp.com. Okay, great. That's awesome. Well, thanks again, Ryan, for joining us today here on the e-commerce marketing podcast. Thank you, Arlen. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce marketing podcast. To access e-commerce videos and other resources to help your business grow, please visit getosi.com forward slash videos. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for e-commerce marketing podcast, and please leave a rating and a review. Thanks for listening. See you next time.